So my sermon's been a lot longer this summer, and partly it's because I need to retell this story every time because we have to jump around. Genesis is a huge book. If you compare the Old Testament and the New Testament, the New Testament's about this big compared to the Old Testament. And so in order to understand the story, we need to remember the story. And so we remember that Jacob uh, was born in Canaan. His father, Abraham, was called out of Aram to go to Canaan, this new land. Jacob, uh, Abraham sent his son Isaac, excuse me, uh, to go get a new wife out of Aram, brought her back. Jacob also went out of Canaan to, to Aram to get a new wife and brought it back to Canaan. So we've got three generations, and now with Joseph, the fourth generation, sojourning in Canaan, people who were aliens in that land. And now we have Joseph, who is the second youngest son, we think, of Isaac, or of uh, Jacob. Jacob gave birth to, let's pause, Rebecca gave birth to Jacob in Isaac's old age. Um, and we have uh, Benjamin, who is Joseph's younger brother. Okay. So we have Joseph and Benjamin, who are the youngest sons of Jacob, and also his most beloved sons, because Rebekah, as you remember from the story of Jacob marrying Rebekah, was Jacob's first love. And Jacob was tricked into marrying Leah, Rebekah's sister. She had a number of sons. Their servants had a number of sons. But Rebekah was barren for a long time until uh, finally giving birth to Joseph and then dying uh, shortly after Benjamin was born. And so here we have this situation where Jacob really loves Joseph and Benjamin more than the rest of their brothers. The brothers have responded to this and to Joseph's sort of understanding of this last week by throwing Joseph into a well. And unbeknownst to them, Joseph is picked up by slave traders, brought down to Egypt where he becomes a slave in Egypt. Now it turns out Joseph is so talented at being a slave, he becomes an overseer of slaves. He gets more prominence down there. Eventually, he runs afoul of the establishments, thrown into jail. And then, as we heard in the children's message today, he has this gift of interpreting dreams that gets him out of jail. Now, that gift of interpreting dreams, you may remember from last week. The precipitating event for Joseph getting thrown into the well by his brothers was him telling them about a dream he had of a bunch of sheaves of wheat bowing down to one of them, saying, oh, yes, this means all you brothers will bow down to me. And so they were sick of this. They uh, presumably wanted this not to come true, so they threw him in a well. And he wound up in Egypt. And then he wound up with the keys to the Pharaoh's treasury. So what happens in this story? All of his brothers come down and bow down before him, fulfilling the prophecy. But there's a lot that happens in between yet. The first thing to remember is let's think about who it is that gets in charge of the project, gets put in charge of the project of getting extra food and money out of people for seven years of plenty and then doling it out for seven years of famine. Is this the guy that is well known for his generosity of spirit? Is this the guy that, say, wins popularity contests? No, this is not that guy. This is the other guy. This is the guy that says, no, uh, you've got quite enough food, thank you. We're going to take the rest of it uh, with these soldiers next to me. Uh, or, no, that's quite enough, thank you. You're going to go away now, or these soldiers next to me will throw you in jail. This is the guy that is in charge of doling things out and the guy that is in charge of making sure people uh, take only what is absolutely necessary. And as we get from the story, the guy who apparently uh, is in charge of selling the grain to their neighbors, presumably, at ridiculous markups. Okay, this is the guy that's in charge. And it's important that it's in charge in Egypt, because Egypt is the place that you can actually do this. You can actually store food up for seven years, because it, basically alone of the entire uh, ancient Near East, is the place with the Nile River Delta. So there's a lot of farmland in Egypt. It is the massive superpower of the region. There are more people in Egypt than sort of anywhere else there. And in times of famine, everyone always goes into Egypt. That's where the food is. So in the way of superpowers everywhere, when there is famine, the weaker countries send their refugees down into Egypt. So that is what's going on right now. Joseph is in charge of basically the only food in the entire ancient Near East. He is the most powerful man in the world. In a time of famine, he controls all the food. 
and presumably again has the attitude to go along with that. And so when these poor refugees from Canaan come down to buy food, to bend knee, they have no power. They are in a world where there is nothing they can do to improve the situation except to come hat in hand to the structures of power in Egypt and hope that it smiles upon them. And as we said, just by inference, we're assuming that Joseph is not the guy with the reputation for generosity of spirit. Could be wrong, but I don't think I am. And part of the reason why I don't think I'm wrong is the reaction of the brothers. They're afraid to ask for that food from him, to ask to buy the food from him. And one of the stories we don't get from the lectionary writers is that, in fact, they have reason to be afraid. They're accused of treason by Joseph. Also, when they go back to Canaan or sent back to fetch their brother down, their brother Benjamin down, Joseph sneaks all the money they paid him back into their bags. Now we, looking on this from the perspective of a generous person, says, oh, how nice Joseph has made it so they don't even have to pay for the grain. He's made a gift of grain to the Canaanites. But if we look at it from his brother's perspective, what would you think? If the most powerful man in the world, who had just thrown you in jail, accused you of treason, sent you back to get your youngest brother, had suddenly snuck a bunch of money back in your bag. Anyone? It's a setup, right? They think that they're being set up to be thrown in jail and possibly killed, because why on earth would this guy give them money? So then they're up in, in Canaan, they resolve not to come back down. They resolve, we're not gonna do it, Jacob says, no, we can't go back down there. He's going to set us up. He's going to take Benjamin too. I'll have no sons left. This is awful. And then it turns out there's a middle, they're in the middle of a famine, and Joseph is the only guy with food. So, of course, they have to go back to him. And what happens? Again, the lectionary readers left this part out. Writers left this part out. He sneaks a precious metal cup into their belongings, uses it as a pretext, says, aha, you are thieves stealing from the royal banquet. I'm going to throw you in jail. So in fact, what happens is everything they had feared. They are set up by Joseph and thrown in jail. So what we have so far is a story maybe of revenge. From our perspective, as Quentin pointed out, it looks like a revenge story up until the very end that Joseph is just messing with his brothers. From their perspective, they don't know who Joseph is. They think that basically the work of the state is out to get them. And everything that happens suggests they're right. They're accused of treason, of being spies, when they just want some food. They're accused of being thieves when they were just eating dinner, minding their own business, trying to avoid getting killed by the state. So that's their mindset, and that's what it seems Joseph has done for them. And maybe who knows what Joseph does to people who aren't his brother. In the end, Joseph makes the choice to forgive them, but it's hard to escape the fact that Joseph has first shown them that he wields unlimited power. That whether they live or die is not up to them, it's up to him. That whatever he decides is the law is the law. He's invited a bunch of refugees down to Egypt to have their food. That is something he chose to do, he could chose, choose to revoke it. We don't know. The brothers don't know. They know they love him. They know what Joseph says. And we hope that Joseph is right, that Joseph sees himself as an agent of God, able to feed the people. But a lot of people say they're agents of God. A lot of people say, I have done this thing for the greater good. So we don't know what the real story with Joseph is. All we know is that in this situation, Joseph has said he forgives his brothers, does invite them down, and they do not starve, which is not nothing. But by jumping ahead in the story, we know also that the people in Israel who wind up in Egypt do not wind up with full bellies forever, because from this story we go into the story of the Exodus, the story of the Israelite slaves in Egypt. This is how they got there. Joseph even now is a slave in Egypt. He has invited his brothers down. We know from what happens next that they are slaves in Egypt too. It was nice when he had the power to feed them. It was nice when he had the power to protect them. But once that was done, 
they again became powerless slaves in a foreign land. And it reminds us that it is good to have faith in people, but that people always change. And that with power, we must do things to bring about change when we can. Because when I read the story, when I see the fears of Joseph's brothers, and I see in the headlines a man shot with his hands up for having committed no crime in Ferguson, Missouri, it doesn't matter what he did. He was shot for no reason. I say, what are the uses of power? Do we use power to make ourselves feel good, to protect ourselves and our families from threats real and imaginary? Or do we use our power to say, no, we are all loved children of God. It is not through fear that we must rule, for Joseph unquestionably ruled from fear. We have the choice to forgive not only our brothers and sisters of blood that wronged us, but to look at the entire world as our brother and sister. We have the power to look and say, no, it is not our wish to be separated by these people who are loved children of God, by the apparatuses of the states to divide us. It is our desire to have apparatuses of the state that protect us all, not to separate us out into criminals and the non-criminal, but to protect us all from acts of crime, whether they are perpetrated by black men robbing a convenience store or white men shooting them with a gun. This is the choice that we have. We can be better than Joseph. And we know this for no lesser reason than we are told so by Jesus Christ, who reminds us that it is not for us to protect only our blood brothers and blood sisters. It is for us to give up the power that we have to bring about the kingdom of God in which all people are seen equal. All people have food enough. All people may not live in fear of arbitrary death, and certainly that they may not live in fear of arbitrary death in our names. This is our choice. What happened in Ferguson, Missouri, was the result of years and years of culture. People decided that was the world they wanted to live in. We have the choice, too, now. What world do we want to live in? Do we want to live in the world where people get shot in the name of protecting us? Or we want to live in the world where we have hope that all people may live to find a better life. Jesus Christ tells us in his life and in his death and in his resurrection that life is hope for all people. We may get beyond death. We need not fear death in eternal life, which means we may take risks to extend the hands of friendship and love to people, even people we think we are not like. Joseph forgave people who wished to kill him. And yes, they were his brothers. But it is our choice to be able to forgive all people whatever wrongs they may do to us, whatever wrongs they may do to society, so that ultimately we may forgive ourselves and build a world based on love instead of fear.